so it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor John McCallum to give us a presentation uh, today at our uh, centre conference. So um, Professor McCallum is the CEO of National Seniors Australia. He's done um, excellent work in the ageing space. He's helped to uh, set up the Dementia Research Institute and um, He's going to talk to us today about what some of the issues are that he thinks are very relevant in the ageing space at the moment. So, John, I'm going to pass over to you to begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you very much, Carly, and a big thanks to the Centre for Ageing, Cognition and Wellbeing at Macquarie for inviting me. I want to talk about the way we're doing research at National Seniors. I'll entitle the talk at Research with a Purpose dealing with older people's feelings, sentiments, and opinions. So let's start at the beginning. There's with pictures in that front of the COVID virus, and I'm going to come to that because it creates a new phase in what's going on in this care area. So I'm talking about unpaid care in Australia. That's where we started. One in 10 Australians are unpaid carers, but there are gender and age gaps. So carers are most likely to be female, and or older. They assist with disability, health, age and childcare. And I'm talking primarily about in the home, although people do cross the boundaries to other forms of care and care in those facilities. So care at home helps people to age in place. And I don't know many people who would want to go into residential aged care, even though some people really do need to. Living at home is by far the preference of all people, particularly of older Australians. Now, caring for grandparents and gr grandparents caring for grandchildren really helps families reduce financial and time burdens in, in, the, in those families. So there's an age and disability care contribution of about 78 billion Australian dollars estimated in 2020. Probably when you cut that back, it's somewhere around 60 or below billion for aged care because it's such a high volume area of care. Child care by grandparents is around about 4.4 billion. So let's talk about numbers. The major funder of aged care is not the government. It is people working from home and caring for people. So getting into this area, uh, along with groups like Carers Australia and so on, we surveyed our large membership over 50 years uh, plus, talking about the care you give. And we asked about who was caring, Caring for whom, who, time spent caring, type and level of caring, and reasons for caring. So who cares? 22%, just over one in five, uh, people who are aged 68 and over. They're both older men and women. And, but there's a, a partner story within the men and women side. But male carers are more likely to be partnered. So you can see in the little circle pie charts, that the, um, as you move from being partnered to unpartnered, that cream coloured uh, slice diminishes quite significantly. So female carers are also likely to be carers even when they're unpartnered. Who are they caring for? Well, they're caring for the biggest group are partners and then caring for parents. Uh, in between, caring for a friend, which I think is a very significant and interesting area. People are not just within the family, they're caring for friends. And then there are people who are caring for sons or daughters, probably disabled uh, or needing help in many ways. The average time spent about 26 hours per week, but some people work seven days a week, 24 hours a day doing care. So the level of care is not light. It's 50% provide medium to high levels of care. It's more than 50%. It's largely with daily tasks, but I'll give a little quote just to give a sense of what else goes with uh, providing daily tasks. We find there's an absence of care plans. So if you were to go into formal, um, paid care delivered into your home, there would be, there has to be a care plan with that. But people caring at home don't have that support or that skill. It is available, but it's not very well promoted, not very well got through to them. So let's look at uh, what one person said, uh, talking about doing daily tasks. It's a very simple, short quote, high level of emotional support needed for father. So I'm there most days, except when really unwell myself. 
So carers reported having poorer health than people who weren't providing care. So this really gives us uh, an insight that more support is needed. Again, if you look at the pie charts, you can, you can see that the, um, the cream and dark colored grows if you're not providing care. So care is a big demand of people's health. And then came COVID. So we're looking at these things and then we were looking at this occurring under COVID. What we noticed first with COVID, it forced older adults into isolation, which meant they couldn't provide their childcare and provide them. It left major care gaps. So that that really highlighted just how important childcare and caring for other people is. We took a look, closer look at the grandparenting role and 26% of our survey provided care to grandchildren and about two thirds or more of that are part of what you'd call a sandwich generation. So you can see that little figure there showing that you're both caring for your grandchildren and your older parents. The mean age of people in that sandwich generation was just under 70. So who cares for grandchildren? Grandfathers and grandmothers roughly equally but again, the partner story comes in. There are fewer single grandfathers providing care. You can see that again in the pie charts. The time spent was an average of about 12 hours per week and grandmothers a lot more time than grandfathers. What about their attitudes and feelings? Well, there's sort of a, a, a most people talk, talk in the first category of love, joy, a chance to pass on wisdom. But there is another category it's an obligation, we feel undervalued, it's demanding. Starting with a quote to support the last one, too many grandparents have their lives ruined as full-time babysitters. And I think some people might identify with that. The second one being the, the, the dominant one, it's the greatest thing in my life, it's very rewarding, or you know, much more lengthy quotes to that theme. So what have we learned from the research? We learned that older adults given received care in large numbers, and this was accentuated by the loss of it during the, the lockdowns. Carers need significantly more and better research. I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of the Royal Commission in my final slides. If we have more effective and accessible support, we will have a great ability to care and to care for longer periods. And this will be quite volunteering, willing care. So, Looking at effective carer supports, what's urgently needed? Uh, carer digital literacy, training and education, where that's something that people are willing to do. Legislation protecting carers, financial support and incentives, practical assistance and wellbeing respite and community care to back that up. We'll talk a bit more about that in terms of one of the things we're doing. So our research through COVID covered three themes. We wanted to document the experiences of older Australians so they weren't lost in history in a peak event and then not talked about, not recorded, not understood. The first thing we found that many people are self-funded, they're above the age pension, but not excessively wealthy, so they don't, don't have to worry about other things. So financial distress of unself-funded retirees was extreme in that period because the economy went belly up, interest rates went down to zero, everything you could imagine that would affect your accumulation and savings really took a negative turn. This is significant disruption to life and caring. And one of the significant ones that we dealt with was when people are not allowed to visit their parents in, in residential aged care with, with sometimes unnecessary lockdowns. And then looking at the unpredictability and uncertainty of the future that people are looking at through COVID. So what were the major concerns that people had? The economy in general was big because people looked at the whole picture, looked at their families, looked at what was going on, and then the value of their investments and what had happened to them and how they were going to provide for themselves with the plans they previously held and previously were executing. Of course, because people were older, they were concerned about minimizing the risk of getting COVID-19, which often meant staying at home. The one I mentioned just before, visiting loved ones in residential care facilities, including caring for someone with dementia where they will only eat their food if uh, a partner provides it. And then when people are dying in residential care, not being able to visit them before they died. 
a terrible situation, but we've had it, it was quite prevalent. Helping parents, not being able to get to them, not being able to travel to get to them, and maintaining any of the caring roles for someone else, particularly grandchildren. So we have to really reframe what we're doing in aged care to, to recognise the impacts of COVID and what we learned. Access the availability and management of quality and paid care at home so that things can happen. Meet the increased demand for services and support for care in the home. We need to do a lot better training and I'm a member of the Aged Care Workforce Council, which is very active in dealing with this. And then address the complex and emerging challenges that are associated with COVID the economic disruption and loss of income, the affordability and continuity of care so people can maintain themselves at home, the isolation and poor mental health, particularly as we're moving forward, and transition in, in sensible ways to digital platforms that can help and not forcing and expecting people to do it on their own, which is the world we're in in terms of digital platforms. We got together with all the consumer groups, so Dementia Australia, the Older Persons Advocacy Network, Council on the Aging, to set up a COVID support line in about July this year. It took outbound calls. We did outbound calls to people we had contacts with and inbound calls. We did checks on their well-being and information to navigate assistance. Uh, as you know, crossing borders became a, an immense complex set of issues changing by the week, the month. So regardless of your age, it was a nightmare to try and work out what was what. So national seniors took on a role of supporting new and emerging communities in Melbourne, out of Melbourne and out, out of Sydney. In Melbourne, we're dealing with Karen refugees from Thai Burma border, with uh, Iraqi re residents who've, who've come in relatively recently, with Horn of Africa communities, uh, with Filipinas, Filipinos and so on. In Sydney, we're going to be dealing with a whole array of Arabic speaking group and Burmese. We're talking about new and emerging communities, not the mainstream communities, but groups who relatively recently arrived, typically from um, with a lot of torture and trauma in their background and certainly extreme difficulties. People who are very isolated and focusing on those and within those groups, focusing on those who are isolated and alone at home. We've now expanded the COVID support line from the end of this month, we're going to go through to the end of June. So we're supporting informal carers from the research and knowledge we have from that. Focusing in on people in regional and remote communities where services are really hard to get and distances are immense sometimes to get to them. And there are black spots for any of the digital options we have. So we extended our called, called program in Melbourne and into the Sydney region. And we're in partnership with the Australian Unity Called Alliance, who are uh, represent those new and emerging communities with people who are articulate and able in that alliance to advise us and, and how to make those contacts and how to do them effectively. So coming up to wind up, when we put in our uh, submission to the Royal Commission on Funding Aged Care, the Submission was entitled Funding from the Base Up, and here's, here's the reason why. We know that the major dollars in care are coming from unpaid care, from that calculation we have of 60 billion or so. So we need to support that major care base to prevent high needs and getting people into paid home care and into residential aged care. So you're supporting higher needs at less cost with people who are willing to do it. If you can support them properly, they can do it better and longer. So then the next, next one up in terms of uh, support is home care, which is again, costing the government less than residential care. So home care really supplements unpaid care at home and is our next largest area of value. So uh, home paid, paid home care is never, never solely on its own. It's always with the support of people working at home. Finally, residential aged care is the most costly and least preferred service, as I mentioned earlier. Some people will, will need that service, but most people don't want residential care, they want to stay at home. Prevention enabled by better respite care will enable people to stay at home and to reduce those costs and to have their preferences respected. The Royal Commission has put in quite a, a number of propositions around getting respite, which are very strongly supported by us in groups like Carers Australia. I wanted to just finish up just to remind us of the real, real impacts of COVID. 
and what, what they did. So we're talking about, um, I would volu I volunteer, I miss it. I need to do those regular activities in my life. I'd love the chance of seeing my family again. Haven't seen any of them since March. I'm missing them more and more, feeling more lonely now. I retired recently and probably shouldn't have. My superannuation has dropped considerably. I'm now worried that it won't be enough. And now I'm too old to get a job. I get panic attacks when people break the distancing laws. So <clears throat> I entitled my uh, topic research with a purpose because in a former life as a researching academic, I did research to get more research funds and got other people to do what we'd recommended. We're now in a position to be able through national seniors and other consumer groups to be able to put into action the recommended recommendations we've found in our research. I think the last point I'd leave you with is that COVID-19 has left major gaps in the needs of older Australians that we have to address. So if I may, I'll stop there and I'm open to any questions and comments. Thank you, John, for that wonderful presentation. You couldn't hear the clapping. We were all clapping here, but I don't think that came through to you. <laughs> it, did, it did on the tail end. I wonder what they're clapping for. I'll get them to clap again, clap again. Hopefully you heard it that time. I did, yeah, I've heard it twice now. I need, sorry, my video is off. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Oh, there you go, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that wonderful presentation and, and um, telling us about some of the work that National um, Seniors Australia is doing. Clearly very important work. Um, and particularly during this COVID-19 period. I um, had some questions and then we're gonna take some other questions for you as well. Um, and I'm sorry if I missed this, but did, did you say how many people have actually used that telephone support line that you have set up since, it, since its beginning? It's, uh, it's did, it, I did, and I didn't say it, but we do have around about 5,000 that we've dealt with in the first six months of it. Uh, so that's, that's a combination of sometimes very long calls, sometimes very short calls, like how can I get across the Queensland border, versus talking through a range of issues with people who are quite distressed. Um, we've, we've had to set up, we, most of the um, consumer groups have, have call centres of various kinds, um, and we've had to make this a, a rather special one where we had people who could respond to, to needs that are there, and in particular, when there's some form of distress that we're not competent to deal with, to be able to, first of all, talk that through and then uh, move it to somewhere else. Um, so I think the real concern now is we're going on for another uh, six months to the end of June, actually. So it's, it's eight months. So There's, there's a noise in the background, I just dealt with it. Uh, we're, we're really looking forward now to that period where we're going to have to deal with what will be some quite significant uh, social issues and mental health issues. And we're linking up with groups and, and dealing with that that way. Yeah, thank you. So could I just finish that and say, we expect to do about 60 to 80,000 by that time. Wow. Um, I mean, John, your presentation really raised um, a number of gaps, as you say, about how um, we get services to older people and what their needs are, particularly during COVID-19. Do you have any ideas um, about how we get those services to people? Because it strikes me that the traditional ways of maybe assisting people needs to change during this period. Yes. So um, the, the strategy that, that the consumer groups have got to is that we have, we have memberships that are very large. So for example, National Seniors has 100,000 members and other people who connect to us who we can connect. So the efficiency of outbound calls is, is really immense. So if I can get the uh, president of one of our branches and then get all the members of that branch and we give them the information we get to them, they're members of the community they live in. They talk to their friends and family. 
So it's it, because we can we have their phone numbers because they're uh, members who get all our information. We can work very effectively with that group across all of Australia. And then when our breaks happen, for example, uh, in Victoria, we switch we switch all our calls to the people there and we work with them. We've actually provided them with small care packages as well uh, when we, we feel that some people need it. And then we switch to Southwest Sydney and then to Adelaide. So we, we can cover a lot of territory. Um, we're, we're probably about a third to half the way through the number of people we can call uh, because we have a very large number. And, and it, it depends on us working through the community. When you're talking about your new and emerging communities, the, um, the refugee swaps from Central America, El Salvador, the Korean refugees from the Thai-Burma border and so on, different groups coming in. Uh, we don't believe that call centres have any role at all from my organisation's point of view. The only way to do that is to get a uh, person in the community, so someone who can speak Amharic if they're dealing with Ethiopian uh, residents and that, that can talk to the leaders in those communities and give them the right sources of information. And then within that community, search out the people who are really isolated and, and go, to, go to those people and begin to deal with that. So the only way to get into those groups, which are language, culture, religion, and sort of um, torture and trauma and isolated in many ways is, is to get into that community and work within it. And we're really grateful that the government has backed us to try that as well. Thank you. So I have a question here from um, Piers. I'm just gonna give Piers the microphone so that he can, actually Piers, just come up here. Professor McCallum, I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Piers Dawes. Uh, hello, uh, fantastic talk. Thank you, John. Um, so people have suggested that maybe use of technology, uh, internet solutions might help people access long-term care, uh, health services, and maintain social contact with friends and family. Uh, have you looked into that at all in your surveys? Yes, we did, did a separate survey, uh, what we call a senior service, and we looked at the prevalence of the use and the type of use. So there's a very set of apps that older people use, so Facebook, uh, where they can communicate with their grandchildren and family overseas and other things. And they use, they use uh, of course, sending messages. Um, Online shopping wasn't very strong, but it's, we're looking to see, we believe it's got a bit stronger through the pandemic. So there is a, there's a joy in getting a parcel delivered, but it's just the getting the technology to work and get it all worked out. So, um, you know, I think we underestimate the tech, tech, the tech skills of older people. When, certainly in our group, we had what we call super surfers who are super competent, competent more competent than I am actually in, in doing this sort of thing. It's, it's a tricky area because there is, is a sort of lack of understanding of it. So what example I would use is that in one case, somebody was asking, what's an app? And if you're thinking of it from someone from the, who's used to technology of the past, it's got to have wheels and springs and things that work. And, and an app isn't like that at all. It's something else entirely. So just getting that sort of familiarity with what it is and sort of getting your hands on the keyboard is a really critical thing. In, in our research work, we find very much, there's a lot of advertising that younger people, particularly grandchildren and so on are wonderful, well they are, but they're just not the right people for training older people in digital skills because they don't understand what's, why people don't understand what's an app. And they go too fast because it's easy for them. So we're using peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And just by the way, that's one of the uh, actions we're taking when we find someone who's saying, look, I really just need to get a bit better in terms of what I can do digitally, we connect them up to a, uh, a peer who we've qualified to do with. And we're supported in that uh, act activity by the Good Things Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to um, steal um, Dr. Paul Strutt's thunder. He's gonna to talk to us a little bit later today um, about the results of a survey that we did, um, a little bit similar to yours, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the wellbeing of community dwelling older adults. Um, and he has some research in there about the uptake of new technology 
uh, in that particular population, like how many people, you know, started to, to um, use ne new technology and the types of technology they used. Um, and I think of interest to you, um, John, we also actually surveyed uh, impacts on grandparenting, um, the relationships and how people felt about that, because you were absolutely right in your presentation when you said that grandparenting is a really important people, you know, a really important part of um, uh, just you know well-being and satisfaction for older people. And we found exactly that that one of the biggest impacts of COVID nineteen was really about how people missed the uh, relationship and the contact that they were having with their grandkids. So um, yeah, Dr. Um, uh, Paul Strutt will tell us a little bit more about that later this afternoon. I look forward to that. I'd love to catch up on that. Excellent. Do we have any other uh, questions? I'll just check to see if I've got any more for you. Could I make a quick comment while you're doing that? Yes, please, go ahead. I think one of the things that we under underestimate the power of is the verbatim comments. It takes you into a depth of understanding of the sensitivities and issues that are there. Uh, it, speak, it speaks to us. We've been, I think, very effective in that and bringing that into some of the retirement income areas where people think of numbers only. But it's very important in the caring areas as well because you can see a number and, and say, yeah, that's terrible. And you hear somebody say it and say, yeah, I understand now. So I think the importance of that in the sort of work that a group like us can do is should, shouldn't be underestimated. Okay, well, actually, I think I'm going to have to uh, move along to our next speaker. So thank you very much for joining us. I'm sorry we couldn't have you on campus, but, well, that's just one of those COVID things that hopefully next, uh, next year, as the uh, restrictions are easing, we'd love to have you out here to come and meet some of the researchers and to hear a bit more about um, the fantastic work you're doing, particularly with that support line. So thank it's you very much. It's a privilege to talk. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. We're clapping again.